So <clears throat> we're going to talk about um, plant responses to environmental challenges. As you can imagine, plants deal with all sorts of things, both biotic and abiotic. <clears throat> biotic, of course, means that, um, you know, it's a pathogen or a herbivore or, and so forth. It's a biological agent. While um, abiotic is um, going to be some type of environmental factor, it might be heat, it might be cold, it might be salt or salinity. It may be um, different minerals, could even be things like ozone and, car and carbon dioxide levels, <clears throat> heavy metals. So these are all examples of abiotic, non living factors that influence the survival in, in plants. And so plants have to deal with all this. If a herbivore attacks a plant, the plant can just get up and start running away. So plant is a marvelous at dealing with all these kinds of environmental stressors. <clears throat> Obviously, coevolution is a big part of dealing with biotics because the pathogen evolves and the plant evolves, and it goes back and forth and kind of what it would be likened to an arms race, which was kind of a bigger deal back when I was a kid. We had superpowers and you had the Russians and the U.S. constantly building up their military might. That was an arms race. Well, co-evolution is a little bit like an arms race where um, pathogens have evolved mechanisms for attacking the plant and then the plant responds in ways that protect themselves. So they've evolved mechanical and chemical defenses. Mechanical defenses would be things like strong cell walls. Now, again, this can also be referred to as not only we talk about coevolution, we can also talk about um, herbivores often in the same light, particularly insect herbivores. But again, <clears throat> plants have developed defenses, whether it be thorns if it was against a, a herbivore. But in the case of pathogens, it, you know, can have a strong cell wall. It might have an epidermis that's waxy, uh, made up of cutidin and suburin and waxes and things like that. These are all things that help keep the pathogen outside of the plant. Because <clears throat> most, pa you know, pathogens for the most part don't have that much of an effect on a plant unless the plant has been damaged or fed on in such a way that it's wounded and it gets past these barriers. So that's kind of the first line of defense in plants is to have these extra thick cell walls and, and cuticles and so forth. <clears throat> now when a plant or when an animal is attacked and damaged tissue, those tissues usually heal themselves and divide and grow again. But in the case of plants, plants tend to seal themselves off because it's not a big deal usually for a plant to lose a leaf. You know, if we lost an arm or something, that would be a really big deal on our um, success rate or survival, uh, at, meaning us animals in general. But a plant can lose a leaf or multiple leaves and still not really be harmed that much. So plants can often seal themselves off from the rest of the plant. Maybe that leaf that's been attacked, they can form a barrier around it that contains the pathogen and the pathogen can't spread. There are going to be cells that die around the area and the cell walls around those cells can thicken and get stronger and the pathogen can be contained. You'll usually see this in lesions and so forth. But the way that the virus if a, or a plant pathogen of some sort can invade a plant is once that plant, those barriers are broken, they can go through plaza desmata. I've, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but remember these are the little holes that are found in the cell walls that allow for the protoplasma um, or the plasma from cell, cells to leak or move into each other's so you can have two plant cells and you have your cell wall that's a border and then there might be little pores that allow the cell to move substances across the other two cells. Well, the problem with that is 
a lot of times pathogens will go through those holes, those plasmodes. So it's important to kind of seal those off and heal and block them so that that the pathogen doesn't move through it. So it limits cell to cell movement. So this is all in line with that first line of defense. You first, you have that, that initial barrier, and then if the virus or whatever gets through that, the plant forms thicker cell walls and tries to prevent it from traveling through the rest of the plant. And it does so by, again, um, blocking the plasma desmata and then forming uh, ligands and things like that that increase the thickness of the cell walls. And, and some of those can be toxic as well to the pathogen. Now, the, the plants have to be able to determine that there's a pathogen there before a lot of that happens. Um, but this results, what, but once this happens, you kind of have also a little bit of a secondary response that takes place. So here's a pathogen coming along, and it breaks into the cell wall and gets in or whatever. There's going to be receptors on the cell membrane that can help detect whether or not there's, there's a pathogen there and help defend itself. And so um, what happens is if the cell, if the plant can detect there's a pathogen there, it will stimulate secondary compounds um, called phytolexins and pathogenous related proteins, and of course polysaccharides. So these are all can be stimulated with the detection of the pathogen. So it's, it's going to trigger the plant to undergo gene expression, messenger RNA is formed, and messenger RNA is then translated into these toxic compounds that are toxic against the pathogen. Or it's going to form the polysaccharides, which thicken the cell wall and help prevent it from spreading. So phytolexins can show up within hours after being attacked. And I think that's also true for pathogenous related proteins or PR proteins. And then enzymes from the, the fungus um, cause the cell, wall, cell walls to release oligosaccharins. Those are the polysaccharides we're talking about. Um, so anyway, the phytolexins can directly attack the pathogen and damage it. And then the cell wall gets thicker. They call them secondary plant metabolites um, to distinguish them from primary plant metabolites. Primary plant metabolites are all the metabolites that are important for growth and photosynthesis and so forth. And so for the longest time, plants were known for making all these secondary compounds, but a lot of people thought maybe they had no use. But the reality is they do have a lot of uses for the plant. And a lot of those uses happen to be defensive. Some of them are nitrogen containing like alkaloids or glycosides and non-protein amino acids. So the alkaloids can affect the herbivore's nervous system like nicotine. Nicotine, obviously a bit of nicotine and you know, a small amount of nicotine can actually stop your heart. So it's very toxic actually. Um, glycosides include things that are like cyanides. Uh, sorghum can form that. And then there can be non-protein amino acids that are formed like in jack bean. Cannabinine is an example of a non-protein amino acid that can kind of join in with your proteins. And so when your body takes that amino acid and joins it into your machinery, you being the animal or the herbivore, it can actually uh, mess up your proteins conformation. So when your body starts making new proteins, this amino acid is added instead of maybe, I forgot which one, another amino acid. And so now the protein doesn't have the right shape and can end up killing the herbivore. There's also phenolics <clears throat> like the phytolexins. Those are flavonoids. Um, these are found in uh, peppers. There's also tannins that you see in, in, from oak trees and stuff like that. Remember, the tannins were also very effective against the kudus 
when it was in really high amounts. And those, I believe those Keisha trees also, when they were watching that video, you'll see tannins leak out of leaves. So if you ever go to a stream, there's a bunch of leaves that fell from the fall and the water turns kind of a tea brownish color. Those are often, a lot of that is due to tannins actually. Uh, quinones are also, um, have the ability to um, have a defensive role for plants, but instead of attacking herbivores, quinones or quinones um, are chemicals that are released by plants that actually can inhibit other plants. Then there's also terpenes that include monoterpenes, squister, I'm pronouncing it wrong, squistery uh, terpenes, I'm sorry for mispronouncing that. We have steroids and polyterpenes. Monoterpenes are actually known as insecticides. You're probably familiar with chrysanthemum tea. Well, that actually makes a pyrethroid. Pyrethroid is an insecticide. So actually when you drink chrysanthemum tea, you're actually taking in some natural insecticide. <clears throat> the pyrethroids are actually effective against insects and not really known to being harmful against mammals, for instance. So there are examples of insecticides that are harmful towards insects, but not harmful towards mammals, at least in acute amounts. We don't always know the chronic effect, but pyrethroids is an example of that, which has its positives and the negatives. Obviously, it's positive for us and not killing birds, but it may kill honeybees and stuff like that. But the point is, um, the reason why some of these are harmful to insects, not humans, is remember insects have a, a dramatically different physiology and they don't have skin, they have cuticle made of chitin. So all sorts of reasons why these chemicals can be harmful to an insect, but not as harmful to a human. Now some insects, or excuse me, some plants actually make steroids that can disrupt the insect hormones and disrupt their life cycles. And this includes ecdysone and ferns. Ecdysone actually can cause the insect to mess up its um, ability to go through, undergo metamorphosis. Um, it can also cause it to, uh, it can also make juvenile hormone that keeps the insect in a juvenile state longer. So all sorts of things that plants can do to kind of mess up the physiology and growth of insects. Now going back to pathogen, Pathogenous related proteins are produced as a chemical defense. Some are enzymes that actually digest the pathogen's wall, like chitinases. Others serve as alarm signals that can then um, signal to healthy, unattacked cells to be ready or to again form that barrier that prevents the, the pathogen from spreading. And again, these are going to be in plants that are resistant to the virus. Not all plants will be able to be resistant to a pathogen. So when a plant is damaged, you'll often see what we call a hypersensitive response. So if a plant is attacked by a fungus, bacteria, or virus, you can have what you call a hypersensitive response where these lesions are formed. So this is an example of lesions where a hypersensitive response has occurred. And these are dead cells that are holding the pathogen. And then you see a layer or barrier around it of other dead cells that help prevent the spread of the virus or pathogen through the plant. So these are all lesions, necrotic lesions. It's kind of like a fire break. You know that a forest fire is coming through, um, forest fire people will break down tear down the trees and try to just turn it into mud and, to make a fire break so the fire doesn't go into the rest of the forest. So they'll sacrifice big troves of trees, right, to prevent the, the forest fire from expanding. Well, that's kind of what's happening here. The leaf, the cells purposely, the plant purposely kills cells to prevent the virus from spreading. The chemical that's also triggered by pathogens is salicylic acid. Remember, 
one of our first lectures, salicylic acid is a defense molecule found in a variety of plants, not just willow. But in willows, it was an active ingredient of aspirin. So acetyl salicylic acid, acetyl salicylic acid is aspirin. So that's kind of interesting. Here we are taking a plant defense hormone and using it to help avoid a headache and reduce inflammation and, and things like that. But salicylic acid, again, is a hormone often associated with the hypersensitive response, and that hormone can trigger then the formation of pathogenous-related proteins. And so we call that the systemic acquired resistance pathway. That's the pathway that, in general, increases resistance of the plant against pathogens. And again, it follows that lesion and that hypersensitive response and causes the production or are involved in the production of pathogenous related proteins. And so the treatment of plants with salicylic acid leads to the synthesis of pathogenous related proteins. And these and salicylic acid can actually be turned into a methyl or, or be turned into a volatile called methyl salicylate. So remember how we talked about volatiles and how they can go from one plant to another? Well, methyl salicylate and you've probably, you've probably smelled it before if you put on an oil, it can often have that uh, methyl salicylate associated with it. And sometimes you can put salicylate on uh, warts and things like that because it's an acid. Well, anyway, this um, plant hormone can travel from one plant to another, triggering the other plant that isn't being attacked to trigger its plant pathogen responses in an advanced warning, you can say, to the other plant. We used to call this talking trees. But anyway, so the plants can talk and communicate to one another. When it's attacked, it can release methyl salicylate, or it can even release methyl jasminate when it's a chewing insect. Now, there's a phenomenon known as gene-for-gene gene resistance. And this is an example of a very specific mechanism. It's almost like antibodies and antigens in the sense where you have a tight bond between the antigen and the antibody. Well, there's a similar thing that kind of happens in plant cells where you have um, proteins or proteins from the pathogen that can be detected by the plant and then trigger all these responses that we talked about. But again, you had to have a pathogen that has the right, I won't call it antigen, but protein that the plant can detect. So the pathogen has a protein or something about it, an allele that makes it very uh, noticeable to the plant. So this is after lots of coevolution has occurred. And then that um, allele, so you can study this on a genetic level, can be studied. Remember, alleles are a, a variety of the gene. So some pathogens will have an allele that provides a protein that can be detected, and some plants will have alleles that allow them to have the, mech, the, the tools to detect the pathogen. And so that's what this picture here is supposed to represent. And you may, you may want to look up a video on this too. But basically, some plants have numerous R genes. These are genes that are, are known as resistance genes. And then many pathogens have avirulence genes. So plants have numerous resistance genes. So the plant has the, some genes that allow it to be resistant to the pathogen. And then many pathogens have what you call avirulence genes that will help them to attack a plant. So it's kind of like a cat and mouse game between whether or not the plant has a, um, the resistance gene that can detect the avirulent gene. And when we talk about genes, we're talking about the byproducts, the proteins that are made. But again, you can study the genes of these things. 
So plants with resistant genes are either dominant with the ability to provide resistance or recessive. And so this makes a difference. If they don't have the ability, if they don't have the resistance genes, they are typically susceptible to a pathogen in some cases. The, aver the averance gene, AVR genes, of the pathogen are either dominant or recessive. So if they have that, that's what allows them to attack the plant. And so this is just a Punnett square you're looking at over here. And we'll get it, we'll talk about this in a second. If just one dominant R gene is present in the plant and the corresponding Averill gene is dominant in the pathogen, the plant can resist the pathogen. So again, the plant must have the resistance gene to make the resistance protein that would detect the pathogen and then do all those things, the hypersensitive response, the, the turning on a pathogenous-related proteins and so forth. So again, the outside of the cell has a pathogen. You notice that there's a, a protein that's associated with the pathogen we're calling it the AVR gene, but again, it's going to be a protein that's formed from the gene. And then on the cell membrane of plants, we have resistance genes that can then be used to detect the pathogen. So what happens if the plant doesn't have the resistance genes? Well, then they're susceptible to the virus or the pathogen. So if there's no resistance genes and there's no ability to detect the pathogen, then the pathogen can attack the plant and you know, kill it or do something to it that causes great harm. So the dominant allele is absent in the plant. And so the plant is susceptible. But if the plant has resistance genes and the pathogen made that avirulent gene, the plant can detect that the pathogen is there and stop it. Resistance. But what's funny though is if the pathogen evolves through the coevolution and gets rid of this AVR, AVR gene, the plant is now susceptible again, even though the resistance gene is present. So again, the plant can detect a pathogen if it has a resistance gene, and that and the and the pathogen is has the AVR gene, and then perhaps if the AVR gene disappears, a mutation occurs. It's no longer detectable by the resistance gene, resistance gene, then the plant is susceptible again. So this happens through a kind of a co-evolutionary thing that takes place over, you know, hundreds of thousands of years or thousands of years, whatever the case may be. This one may be worth looking up a little bit more if you're still confused on that. So plants mount a specific immune response to RNA viruses. Plant enzymes are used to convert some of the single-stranded RNA of the invading virus into a double strand. This double strand is chopped into pieces called small interfering RNA. I'll explain this a little bit more. These small interfering RNAs interact with the cellular components to degrade, degrade the, the messenger RNAs produced during transcription, blocking replication. This phenomenon is an example of interference RNA or RNAi. So you may have heard of RNAi, um, and we probably should watch a quick vid video on that to help understand these two different concepts I just described. RNAi is a way that we have the ability to knock out genes now. And so it's a technology that we've learned thanks to plants. So a single strain of RNA that the plant, the virus might have injected into the plant, um, the plant forms a corresponding complementary strand 
And so when they, um, one single strand is formed, the other one is formed as well, and, and it'll stick to it. This will make a little bit more sense once I show you a, a, a quick video on that. However, there again, there's always this coevolution going. So plant viruses have mechanisms that can also confound this interfering RNA. So again, it's a, it is a coevolution account mouse game that takes place or arms race. And so natural selection favors both improved attack mechanisms from the pathogens and improved defense mechanisms from the plant. So let's take a look at maybe a quick video on um, gene for gene interaction and um, RNAi. Let me pause it for a second. That's really cool. Did you know that just like humans, plants have an immune system? It helps them defend against parasites as diverse as fungi, bacteria, viruses, nematodes, and insects. Over 75 years ago, an American scientist called Harold Floor studied how plants defend against parasites. He discovered that for each resistance gene in the plant, there's a matching gene in the parasite. But again, you know, the, that's his model idea. It really comes down to what the proteins are doing, but he would look at pathogens and see things that would help them to be virulent, and he looked at plants and saw that they had genes that helped them to be resistant. He called this the gene-for-gene gene model. Floor's work was hugely influential. It helped guide breeding disease resistance in pretty much every crop plant. Later, scientists found out that plants have an immune system to defend against invading parasites. Floor's disease resistance genes turned out to be sensors that can detect the parasite and initiate an effective immune response. More recently, scientists realized that the plant immune system is much more complex than Floor's model indicates. Disease resistance genes appear to work together in intricate networks to deliver a robust immune So it realizes so it's not really just a single gene, there's obviously other genes involved in making the plant hormones or the phytolexins and stuff like that. But um, so, but again, it still provided a model because it allowed them to find a gene or two that they saw was a resistance gene. And if these plants had it, then they're more likely. So the release provided plant breeders with a clue on um, what to breed for. Response. These immune networks enable plants to detect and resist parasites more effectively for several reasons. First, networks are more robust and can still function even when one of the components fails. Second, networks enable plants to mount an optimal immune response when the environmental conditions are changing. Finally, networks are more adaptable, allowing plants to evolve more rapidly to keep up with constantly evolving parasites. This view of plant immunity has implications for plant breeding. We lose so much food to disease. If we can better understand how immune systems work, we can make plants more resistant to disease and produce more food using less pesticide than we do today. From Floor's gene for gene model to today's systems view of plant immunity, a fundamental understanding of how plants fight parasites is vital. Yeah, like RNA RNA. The study of plant immunity is just one example. I need to find one that isn't as uh, popular. Let's put that way. Right. The parasite is called rust, although it is actually a type of fungus. So that'd be a stomata right there. So the fungus is going to try to get through the stomata. Remember, the stomata are little holes on the bottom of leaves that allow for gas exchange. The invading rust fungus has penetrated deep inside the plant tissue. As the invasion progresses, the fungus produces spores. These spores erupt from the surface of the plant.
The spores spread, creating pustules, new sites of infection. Soon the plant's stem and leaves are covered in fungal growth. Carried by wind, the fungal spores can travel great distances, eventually reaching other potential hosts. So in this case, apparently this plant doesn't have the ability to resist the virus, or excuse me, the, path, the fung fungi pathogen. This spore must now find the nutrients it requires to grow. Sending out the germ tube, it seeks an entry point into the plant. A newly formed penetration tube breaks inside the stem and the fungus extends further into the plant. Once inside the stem, another structure called the haustorium is used to penetrate inside one of the plant's cells. The fungus can now take nutrients from within the plant. It also begins to secrete small protein molecules called effectors. This is a critical time for the plant. If it can detect the fungal effector proteins, it can try to stop the invasion. So this would be equivalent to the AVR. Um, you know, genes that the plant was making. Or excuse me, the, the pathogen was making. So can the plant detect the AVR? Obviously in one case it didn't. Does it happen here? The plant has specialized resistance proteins which act like an immune system. So this would be equivalent to the resistance gene that we were talking about. The gene for gene. The resistance proteins can bind to the fungal effector proteins. This binding event alerts the plant that an infection is taking place. Now that the parasite is detected, the infected cells are sacrificed, cutting off the energy supply to the invader. The fungus will eventually starve and the plant can continue to... So that's the forming of the lesions that we were talking about earlier. ...grow. New strains of fungi are constantly developing through evolution. This can make some plants vulnerable to infection. Diseases like rust fungus have plagued crop production since people first began farming. Globally, infections of rust destroy 15 million tonnes of wheat each year. Because of this, wheat breeders must vigorously seek new sources of resistance to protect crops. Perhaps by investigating the interactions between plants and their invaders, we could one day prevent the devastation caused by rust fungi. Let me look at one more thing. There's an unseen arms race in progress between plants and bacteria. Bacteria and other pathogens can infect plants by entering through wounds or stomata. Once inside, bacteria inactivate the plant's defences by injecting proteins into the plant cells, allowing them to feed on the plant's nutrients. Sometimes the plant fights back by killing its own cells around the bacteria and producing antimicrobial chemicals. This stops the spread of infection and is called the hypersensitive response. A bacterium called Pseudomonas syringae causes the disease halo blight in beans. The bacteria have a genetic quirk, a mobile piece of DNA, called a genomic island on the chromosome. This contains a gene that produces an effector protein that the bean recognises 
triggering the hypersensitive response. The hypersensitive response triggers the genomic island to leave the chromosome and become circular. Then, as the bacteria reproduce, the circular island can be lost. Unfortunately for the plant, this means that the bacteria no longer trigger the plant immune response. They can multiply rapidly and infect surrounding cells. The bacteria that do still have the genomic island have a very clever way of hiding from the immune response. The island can supercoil or curl up tightly. The genomic island is never lost from all of the bacteria in case it's needed again when conditions change. So again, it's another one of those examples of an arms race. All right, let's go back to... And everybody sees my PowerPoint slides, of course, so. All right, so going back on to plants and herbivores and uh, so forth. So grazing is what happens when a predator feeds on a plant without killing it. Most uh, herbivores are a type of parasite usually. Um, obviously you think of grazers, you probably think of cattle or something like that, but realize even our caterpillar is kind of a grazer. And usually these plants will suffer, but they don't necessarily get killed. Um, in some cases though, the herbivores will actually increase photosynthesis. Um, so if, uh, um, after the plant's been damaged, the plants have co-evolved the ability to increase photosynthesis. Um, but this is, again, not all plants. A lot of plants will also decrease photosynthesis. We've seen that as well. So, again, this is more typical of grazers. Um, this increased photosynthesis is based on three phenomena. The nitrogen obtained by the soil from the roots is no longer has to be divided among so many leaves. In other words, um, photosynthesis and the, the formation of chlorophyll. Um, if that plant, one leaf has been damaged, another leaf essentially is being is compensating and the nitrogen that would have gone to the roots to this leaf over here is now being shuttled over to this leaf. Um, What's that? Sorry, I unmuted. I apologize. My mom was talking to me. That's fine. And then, um, and so this, so plants are have ways of trying to compensate for that damage. Um, they can export sugars from the leaves that may be enhanced um, from that photosynthesis and sent to the roots that need it. Um, so this is typical of grasses. We see this a lot more in grasses where grazing is a common phenomenon. In fact, some plants actually grow better after they've been chewed on by a herbivore. And that's been seen, for example, in this, um, I guess it's called scarlet gilia, where grazing removes 95% of the above ground plant. And what happens is this plant that's been eaten grows back in higher and more stems and so forth. So that clipping actually causes the plant to rebound and grow more vigorously than the uncropped plant. So this is typical of plants that are normally grazed upon substantially. Um, you can see these in fruits and things like that. So sometimes when people remove buds, they remove the terminal bud where the apical meristem is located. And what happens if they cut off the top one, side branches will grow better. That's also kind of related to this as well. So the plants can actually grow better after damage. They've evolved that ability, some plants.
so going on with plant animal defenses, obviously, make sure I don't pass the slide up here and go back. So plants have evolved many mechanisms to defend themselves from herbivores. Often, um, this may involve indirect defenses, which is the SOS signal where a plant will release volatiles that can be released into the air. And then that'll attract a predator to go find the caterpillar, caterpillar that's chewing on the plant. So the plant's releasing a chemical perfume, a volatile, with a signature that's attractive to parasitic wasps or to predators like lady beetles. There's also direct defenses that plants form, such as thorns, spines, and prickles. So these would be morphological examples of morphological defenses or structural defenses. Again, secondary compounds are our chemical defenses. We talked about this a little bit with alkaloids and things I mentioned earlier. But these chemical defenses are present ubiquitously among all sorts of plants, including algae. And some have been studied very closely, like mustard oils in the mustard family. Braskies. Brasky. So the mustard oil um, is toxic to a lot of herbivores. But again, going through the, you know, we talked about coevolution in the arms race. Coevolution is the idea that, um, you know, it's, it's said that the, the um, antelope gave the cheetah its speed. The idea is the antelope is fast and the cheetah comes fast enough to eat it and then eats off. And then the whatever is left that wasn't eaten are the really fast antelope. So they reproduce, have more offspring that are fast. And the ch slow cheetahs don't reproduce, but the fast ones do. And so we have this constant over generation, over generation of cheetahs that become extremely fast and evolved for chasing down extremely fast antelopes. That's a coevolutionary relationship. But we see this also in plants where the mustard oil can kill off a lot of caterpillars. But some caterpillars it doesn't kill off <coughs> develop um, metabolism that allows them to, to um, appreciate the mustard oil in, in quotes to the point where the mustard oil now becomes attractive to the butterfly to feed on it. So it's co-evolved with this plant. So it becomes what we call a specialist. So this... Um, um, cabbage butterfly becomes a specialist feeding on cabbage. So again, coevolution is a term that describes the long-term evolutionary adjustments of species to one another, as I described before. And there's certain types of coevolutionary relationships. Some become symbiotic, where two or more kinds of organisms can live together, known as mutualism, where both species benefit. Parasitism, when one species benefit while the other is harmed. And then commensalism, when one species benefits and, and neither is harmed, nor, you know, neither. You, the other one isn't, ben one benefits, but the other one isn't harm or doesn't really benefit as well. So we talked about the ant and the acacia tree. That's an example of a mutualistic relationship where the ant benefits from the, its relationship with the acacia. Parasitism includes the parasitic wasp or um, um, insects just feeding on plants. That would be an example of parasitism in a sense. Not quite living, but symbiotic. It's kind of stretching the word of parasitism. Obviously, we think more of um, internal parasites and things like that. It's on the same idea. And, some, and there's definitely insects that can feed inside and live inside leaves. 
And then commensalism, again, one is hard, but the other isn't. And we'll give examples of these. So here is examples of mutualistic relationships between insects and, of course, between insects and plants. The aphids, for instance, are these little green dots here. So again, they have small piercing sucking mouth parts that allow them to drink the nectar from plants. These ants are actually farming the aphids. And so when the aphids drink the nectar, the nectar comes up into droplets that the ants will eat. So the ants are providing protection to the aphids because normally ladybugs, lady beetles, would come along and eat the aphids. But these ants will protect the aphids from the lady beetles. Um, so in exchange though, the ants have access to the nectar or the waste products that come out of the aphid. So, you know, it'll drink the nectar of the plant, form a droplet on the top um, through its waste, and the ant will eat it. And that's called honeydew. So again, the ants are providing protection to the aphids, even transporting them and moving them around. And then we have ants and acacia. So that's another example of a mutualistic relationship where the ants provide protection for the plants against herbivores, where they will be able to chase away herbivores, whether it be insect, and I think in some extreme cases, they might be able to chase off even vertebrate herbivores, those with backbones. In exchange, these plants have evolved Belgian bodies, which is food for the ants. So the ants will eat the, the Belgian bodies and um, benefit as a food source. And again, exchange the ants, protect the herbivore. They'll even move organic nutrients around and they might kill off a plant that's causing shading. So maybe another plant's growing beside the acacia. Those ants might destroy that plant so that it doesn't shade their, their plant that they're, they're feeding on. So, the, so it maximizes the sunlight. So it's pretty remarkable the type of relationship these ants can form with their acacia plant. And a Belgian body is, again, evolved as a food source for the ant. Now, par parasites can include things like this daughter um, plant. It's chlorophyllous parasitic plant that will literally find a tomato plant or whatever. It can actually smell the volatiles, go to it, wrap itself around it, and start taking the, the nutrients from the plant. This plant does not have its own chlorophyll. So it's a parasitic plant. Um, you can consider that an ectoparasite because it lives on the surface. Um, insects can also have ectoparasites on them as well, as well as parasitoids, as I mentioned before, that provide protection for the plant. When the plant releases its SOS signal, a parasitic wasp will fly, sting the caterpillar or whatever, lay its eggs on it, and then the eggs will either become larvae inside the, or the lay eggs inside the caterpillar and grow. Wasps, like I said, are, are famous for being parasitoids. Parasitoids will result in killing the host, while parasites might not necessarily kill the host. Now, Again, I already mentioned this a little bit, but primary metabolites are any kind of substance that the plant makes that helps provide nutrients and growth for the plants and photosynthesis. It's the primary um, pathways of survival. Secondary metabolites tend to be all these other kind of factors that at one time 
people that were researching plants thought, why are they all making all sorts of chemicals? And in reality, these chemicals often have a function for a plant. It may be um, function as a fungicide or insecticide or a poison of some sort. As I mentioned before, some plants even form amino acids that aren't harm that are harmful. Like arginine is an important amino acid. The cannabine is an amino acid that's a lot like arginine. And so animal bodies will take the cannabine and put it into their proteins and end up making a protein that's not functional and actually kill or cause abnormalities in insects. So this is an example of, of a toxin. So again, they're gonna, it can make for, um, so the transfer RNAs will actually take the cannabine over just like it's an arginine, but it won't work when the final protein is made. Hopefully you remember a little bit of translation and stuff like that. So here is an example of plant defense pathways. It has some similarities in some regards to um, gene for gene, because the, it's not only the damage of the plant, but it can also be the chemicals that come from the caterpillar that can trigger different responses. So here's a caterpillar feeding on a plant, releasing cystimin. Cystimin is a polypeptide that will trigger jasmate formation, particularly in tomato plants. So here is a cystimin receptor. So the plant's been damaged. Cystimin will attach to it. And then through a chemical cascade that's more complex than what's being shown here, it'll form jasminate. And as I mentioned before, jasminate is a plant hormone for plant defenses against typically herbivores and or against wounding. So it also um, can trigger those kind of things. Often jasmine will actually reduce photosynthesis in this leaf. Um, but this might be like in the case of tobacco plants, nicotine will be stimulated, the alkaloid will be stimulated. So again, there's all sorts of different types of plant defenses. defenses. Here's just some examples. Arsaline is a protein produced by wild bean seeds that converts resistance to bean weevils. Arsaline toxicity has been tested on in rats to determine if arsaline is safe in foods for humans. Some genetically engineered plants produce pesticides such as arsaline. Another example is Bt, but this is an example that's actually human-driven. Bt is Bacillus thuringiensis. That's a bacteria that makes a crystal that's harmful towards insects. So Bacillus thuringiensis um, is a crystal, again, that's formed by the bacteria that can kill caterpillars, kill mosquitoes, this depends on the species of Bt. Well, what researchers have done is they've taken that Bt gene and put it into corn plants. And now we have Bt corn, for instance. At one time, and I haven't heard much debate about it lately, that Bt corn was kind of a hotly debated thing early on when I was in grad school. And I don't hear much about it, but I guarantee you, a lot of that corn outside in our fields around Macomb are going to be BT corn. And again, this will help kill off a lot of caterpillars that would feed on the plant. It doesn't mean it's perfect, right? Because um, plants can evolve resistance to BT if um, all you, you do is shove BT down its throat, so and no, and no pun intended. So what a lot of times researchers, or not researchers, growers are supposed to do, farmers, they're supposed to leave a certain percentage of the crop resist or susceptible to caterpillars and not BT corn. The reason for that is if you put a strong selection factor where you just put nothing but a toxin against the insect, usually the insects will evolve resistance quickly. 
to it. But if you leave a certain percentage or portion of your crop susceptible to caterpillars, then you're going to have a, a, a large percentage of caterpillars, evolutionarily speaking, down the road that are still susceptible because they'll still be able to grow and reproduce. So it takes a lot more generations for caterpillars to, to form a resistance to the toxin or to the insecticide or whatever. So even if we, so we don't want to just throw insecticides in huge amounts on plants to try to protect themselves or use BT a genetically engineer, because again, you're going to increase the speed at which insects will evolve resistance to the toxins. Again, as you already mentioned before, uh, plants can produce their own toxins and they can often keep it compartmentalized. Um, some insects evolve the ability to take those toxins and use, utilize them for themselves. So if an insect has evolved a, a strong co-evolutionary relationship, let's say like the monarch butterfly has with um, its plant, host plant, it can take the toxin milkweed and take that toxin and put it into its tissues and so when a bird tries to eat it it can actually become sick and, and avoid more like butterflies so all sorts of evolutionary stories are happening constantly what is the benefit of that though if to what? if if um the um if it puts the toxin inside itself but then the bird eats it it didn't save the insect it just killed the bird and the insect well, it didn't kill the bird. What happens is the bird becomes sick and throws up and learns to avoid eating uh, monarch butterflies. So, oh, might, it, it, oh, it, Does the insect yeah. then survive? No, the insect dies, but its brother didn't die. Its cousins didn't die. And so those individuals will still have a better chance of surviving. So even it's, that's almost altruistic. Right. Exactly. And then there's other caterpillars that take advantage of that, like viceroy caterpillars, or viceroy butterflies. Viceroy butterflies look a lot like monarch butterflies. And to a bird that's learned to avoid a monarch, it'll avoid the viceroy as well. So that's a type of mimicry. Batesian mimicry is what they call it, actually. I don't know if you remember that from a general biology class or not. So some plants will also, you know, sometimes these um, plants will have these toxins, and they'll keep them separated in compartments. And when the plant is chewed on, the, the toxin, the, the non-toxic or precursor toxins come to convert together, then the enzymes will convert them into something toxic like cyanide, for instance. There's also um, lactifers, latex. So lactifers are like veins that have this latex in it that are hydrophobic poisons that can cause uh, mouth parts to get sticky. Have you ever broken open a plant and you'll see this white milky stuff come out? That's the latex. That's usually a plant defense. And it'll gum up the mouth parts so the mouth parts don't work so well. And often there's toxins in the plant and those in that um, latex as well. And um, so that's the example. Uh, milkweed might make a lot of it. Here's a beetle whose mouth parts are getting all gummed up. But the funny thing is there's some insects that evolved the ability to chew on the plant in such a way that it'll drain the latex without eating it, let the latex drip away, and then it'll eat the upper part of the leaf. So there's always these arms races going on. Okay, now let's move to more abiotic things like plants that have adapted the ability to live in extreme environments. Um, xerophytes are examples of this. So here are some plants that 
So plants can evade drought by carrying out their life cycles as seeds for long periods of time and then wait for that brief, intense rain, rainy season to come along and start growing. So that's an example of an adaptation. And then they'll grow like crazy. <clears throat> Typically, plants that grow very slow and live in very harsh environments often can be more toxic than plants that grow rapidly. Um, so some plants that can grow rapidly, their defense is just to keep growing rapidly and, and get to flowering stage quickly before the herbivores notice them. So there's all sorts of stories like that going on. Obviously, in deserts, we see smaller leaves that helps prevent evaporation, and we see more defense, more energy put in defenses like these thorns or pricklies, you know, as a cactus. And then a lot of the succulents can form where they can have uh, fleshy areas that store extra water. Or um, and, and do all sorts of things to try to avoid the sun. They may have thicker cuticles to help prevent water loss. And their stomata might not be on the surface, where the stomata is the hole. It might be more sunken. All sorts of things to try to prevent water loss. Maybe they close their stomata during the sunny part of the day and open it at night. So all sorts of adaptations happen to avoid drought. Um, they may have deep tap roots that will help them to attain water deep under the ground. But typically, zero fights grow slowly and um, are more efficient at doing photosynthesis and not losing water while doing so. And so, and again, their metabolism can be even a little bit more unique too by where they're accumulating apparently amino acids like proline in their vacuoles. And this is a, affects the water potential so you, it can absorb more water from the soil. <clears throat> then you got the other extreme where you have plants that live in extreme water environments where the roots will actually grow out of the ground into the air because they and, and avoid um, root rot and things of that nature. And so these are known as nematophores. So they, again, they grow extensions out of the water up into the air. And they have lenticles with spongy tissues that allow them to, to get oxygen from the environment because they can't get enough oxygen under the water. A good example of this is cypress and some mangroves. They have these nematophores. So again, plants have evolved all sorts of abilities to deal with these extreme environments. Here's an examples of aquatic plants that have large air spaces that allow them to float on the surface, called arinchomae, arinchoma. Um, and then they can do photosynthesis there as well and allows for buoyancy. I always thought it'd be kind of fun to study aquatic plants and look at the herbivores that might be associated with them. Now, not all soils are great for growing, right? So we have some soils that have lots of salt in them. So some plants have evolved the ability to avoid being dealing with salts because obviously salts can high levels of salts can be toxic, pulling out water out of cells and so forth. So plants adapted to saline environments are called haliophytes. So these are examples of plants that can live in extreme um, saline environments. They're called haliophytes. Most hyaliophytes transport sodium and chloride ions to the leaves um, to get rid of that extra salt and increase their water potential because they don't want to lose water to the environment. That's the biggest factor or concern. 
<clears throat> so scientists will study about heliophytes and then they can learn about what genes might be involved and maybe use that for agriculture to protect our plants and allow us to grow more crop plants in what would normally be environments that aren't a good environment to grow in. Here you can see the salt glands from heliophytes being released on the surface. So it's getting rid of that excess salt and now it's sitting on top of the leaf. And then that can be removed by rain and wind to get rid of that extra salt. Anyway, so this again increases water potential <clears throat> and it also helps to regulate transpiration in such a way that it benefits the plants. Remember, transpiration is pulling water up through the roots, up through the xylem to the stomata and the leaves. So they're going to try to maximize um, having the right amount of water for its metabolism. So again, proline seems to be an important amino acid for helping with water potential and that many heliophytes and xeriophytes accumulate this amino acid proline, which obviously helps in protecting its water potential from becoming negative. Um, succulents um, also can hold on to lots of water, again, with those spongy tissues. <clears throat> And then apparently there's a crashing acid in metabolism as an adaptation for water conservation. And this has to do with when they open up the stomata. Again, what happens is they will typically close their stomata during the day, the hottest part of the day, and then open their stomata at night to allow um, the transpiration to take place to pull the water up the roots. Now, the reason why they do that is to, again, maximize cons conservation of water. The problem with that, though, is photosynthesis normally takes place during the brightest parts of the day, the light cycle, anyway. And so um, can plants, though, have evolved again the ability to do a lot of its photosynthesis activity at night and open its stomata at night. And again, that helps reduce water loss. <clears throat> some plants can survive some, again, extreme environments. Often there's um, situations where mining's taken place, and so we have heavy metal contamination. Some plants can actually concentrate that heavy metal and then we can take those plants and dispose of them or, or whatnot to help um, in bioremediation. So this, again, plants provide some potential for us to reclaim soils that have been destroyed by poor environmental practices or mining practices. And so that's something that can be useful. Um, apparently roots can, um, in China, they're finding that a buckwheat grown in China has a tolerance for high aluminum. The roots secrete oxalic acid, which combines with aluminum to form a compound that is non-toxic. So that's pretty cool. So again, plants, I think if you're interested in being a botanist, there's lots of important things that need to be done. Plants can deal with extremes of hot and cold. Um, we've talked about some of the ways this happens um, with the closing of the stomata and having small leaves um, and so forth. But plants also produce what they call heat shock proteins. These are proteins that help to hold other proteins in shape. If you ever cooked an egg, what happens when you cook an egg is the egg denatures. So you, you crack your egg, you put it on the stove, and it starts becoming white from cooking process. That is denaturing. Or if you put it in acid, it denatures. 
extreme temperatures denature things. And that's the problem if you started cooking your ham over a fire. That's denaturing the proteins or salts denature the proteins. And what happens when we're talking about denaturing, again, remember proteins have a specialized shape that work properly. When you denature it, you take it out of that proper um, conformation, that proper shape. Heat shock proteins are surrounding this protein and help keep it in its proper shape so it'll still keep functioning. When a plant is exposed to extreme heats and colds, they'll produce more heat shock proteins. And in doing so, they can help protect the, the important proteins needed for their primary metabolism. So again, that helps in, they function as chaperones in a sense. They're right next to it, helping to keep it shape. And they'll do that in ex often in extreme heat, like 40 degrees Celsius, but they can also do it in cold as well. Or even plant stress from caterpillars and things like that can, can trigger heat shock proteins. But again, it's kind of a, it should be done in a slow manner. So you can harden, cold harden some plants. As long as the process is slow, you can, you can expose plants to um, colder and colder temperatures and you might be able to get a little bit more of a growing season out of them. But a cold snap is usually more dangerous to plants than the plants that have been exposed to non-injurious cold for longer periods of time. Some plants um, can have oils that help prevent freezing and breaking. That's another example of some way some plants avoid being damaged because those ice crystals is what causes problems for plants. When the ice crystals form, they can damage the cells and then the cells no longer function properly. And so again, they can, they can, so a lot of plants will have antifreeze proteins that prevent, along with heat shock proteins, to prevent the um, plant from being damaged, along with unsaturated fatty acids and things like that, that again can help maintain the fluidity of the cell membrane. So, are there any questions specifically in regards to the lecture? Be posted on Western Online, or is it already? I wasn't sure. I don't think I had printed off this one. Yeah, there is a PDF of it. Um, I noticed on Western Online. If you like the actual PowerPoint, I can upload that. But it's like set up as six slides per page right now. A PDF will be fine. Thank you. Yep, and I will post um, this lecture too. Of course, um, I've been trying to do that. And I, I think I, most, I think everybody's doing great in the class. I noticed somebody mentioned this, so I still need to go back and just make sure that Western Online does some weird things where you can't just put a, have the system set up where you have the proper points always. So sometimes it can do funny things where the, it tells you you're getting these points and then you find out that's now out of 15 or something. I know. So I will still need to go in there and check that I haven't seen any situation where anybody has done poorly on any of the assignments. So I will try to make sure to get that fixed sometime this week. I forgot who mentioned that, but I think that was in this class. All right. Well, you all have a good evening. Um, um, I wanted to ask you something after while people leave. No one has to stay. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording then. Um. I was just going to ask about your entomology course. So I emailed Dr. Cooper, you know, and she said I have to make sure, you know, I know exactly what the course entails. So you're cool with me doing it from home, right? The biggest issue will be that you'll need to um, do an insect collection. Insect what? Um, with entomology, you'll need to do an insect collection. So you'll have to do a lot of running around with a net. 
All right. You, you know, you know where I'm at. Do you think where I'm at, I'd be able to find what I need? Uh, mostly, you might have to do some nighttime kind of things, mm-hmm. where you maybe you know you turn on your porch light and you go collect a bunch of insects that way too. Okay, or I can put maybe rig something with a light that has it that captures them. Yeah. Now, do they need to be dead or alive? Well, ultimately, what you'll do is you'll collect them, put them in a bag, and freeze them. Okay. So if I got one of those bug zappers to collect them, would that work? The only thing is that you may, we're trying to make an insect collection that looks nice. So as long as it doesn't damage them too badly. All right. Um, and if worst came to the worst and you feel like it, I might be able to, since we live close enough, I could come by one evening and give you some basic guidance to if there's yeah. something that you're confused about. Yeah. I'm just trying to think. Um, in terms of how and what I'd be capturing, because um, I don't know how you'd even do it at Kibby. I mean, same thing, you'd be running around with a net, right? Right, but there's a lot more environments. Yeah. There is some woods by me. You know, there's Hornfield Campus not too far from here. Yeah, as long as you got permission, you can collect there, and then you may want to go to Spring Lake and because there'll be different insects around water sources. Than- well, um, I could always go by that pond at the university. I don't care. I'll do that. Yep. Yeah, the more environment you have, the more diversity of insects you'll have. Yeah. I don't mind going to places in town. I just don't want to go out to Kibby right now. 